Hello, bakers from around the world. I have been watching the thread and you're watching from everywhere. So welcome to OEM 101. This time we are jumping all over chocolate Swiss roll. First, a hello to family, to friends, to people I've been chatting with through social media feeds um, over the last couple of weeks. We put the vote to you. You pick chocolate Swiss roll, which we seem to be on a bit of a sponge cake kick, aren't we? But you know what? I have to say I'm thrilled that you picked a chocolate recipe because I haven't baked with chocolate or chocolate ingredients in some time. And so this gives me a chance to get my chocolate craving fixed and also answer some chocolate questions at the same time. We have collected a few of your questions. So as I get into it, I've actually made a note of some of them. We will have time here and there to take your other questions too. And Trina, I saw your note about asking for another devoted live Q&A. Well, TJ, who you see pop up on our conversations here, he and I were having the same conversation. So I think we're gonna book one of those in. But right now, I'm here to make chocolate Swiss roll. Perhaps you're baking along with me. So I will walk through this step-by-step -step, deliberately talking about every single phase as we go along. Because as you know, OEM 101 is really about mastering the technique of a specific recipe um, and really getting into the heart of it to empower you as a baker. So being a type of sponge cake, a Swiss roll, uh, sometimes in North America, we call it a jelly roll. And the filling really determines its name. A Swiss roll typically has a cream filling. A jelly roll, by rights, has jelly in the filling. But it does start with eggs. Whether you're doing a conventional one, a chocolate one, or a gluten-free one, as this is. So the first thing I need to do is separate my six whole eggs. They are at room temperature. And so I'm going to separate the whites into my mixing bowl. The yolks I'm going to whisk by hand so they can just go into a large bowl. There we go. And you'll notice if you followed me uh, watching Oh Yum, all the videos, you notice that I tend to crack my egg on a flat surface, not on the edge of a bowl because look at that clean edge. Do you wanna zoom in, Michael? My sweetie Michael's doing the directing here. Down a little, okay. See how the eggshell has no sharp edges to it, so it won't catch your yolk and break it. If you crack that egg on a flat surface too, you get this nice clean break, and you don't have those tiny little pieces to drop into your bowl. It takes a little practice, but it takes one smack. You don't want to do it multiple times because then that creates more shell pieces. And back and forth is simplest. You are still going to get some egg whites on your hands. If you're in a real hurry, some bakers actually separate the egg by tipping it into their hand, holding the yolk while the white sifts through their fingers. I leave that up to you. I'm quite comfortable with this method. Keep in mind, though, if you're working with room temperature eggs, that because they are slightly warmer, you'll find the white is softer, so it separates faster, but it does make the yolk a touch more fragile. If it does happen that you get a bit of yolk in your white, you don't want to leave it there because any fat in the egg whites will prevent it from whipping. So, what you do is you actually use your cracked eggshell. So if you get a droplet, let it settle into place. And then to get that droplet of egg yolk out, the concave curve of the eggshell will cause it, if you tip it towards the egg white, you'll find that little droplet of yolk will jump right into the curve of your eggshell and you can extract it easily. Little add -in. Put there, now, um, this is a great point for me to answer. Let's see. I think it was Sherry asked the question about reducing sugar in your recipe. This recipe calls for 150 grams or three quarters of a cup by volume of granulated sugar. And I'm just going to whisk that by hand because once you add your sugar to you, your egg yolks, you have to start mixing it right away. You can't let it sit or you'll get a sort of a set. It almost looks like the egg yolk is cooking in the sugar crystals, but once you start mixing it, then you're fine. 
I'm just gonna whisk it by hand. You can see now how it's very yellow. But by hand, for just a minute or so, it doesn't have to be terribly vigorous. We're not looking for any particular type of volume, but you want it to turn more of a butter color. So I'm just going to keep whisking, allow the sugar to dissolve. While we talk about the importance of sugar in sponge cakes particularly, um, it was Cherry. Cherry wrote and said um, she tried making a sponge cake using a stevia powder and the sponge cake fell and there was a strong aftertaste. Well, stevia by nature does have its own flavor, different than sugar, but sugar is very important in any type of sponge cake, and a sponge cake being anything with whipped eggs, because it lends structure and moisture. You will not be able to roll your jelly roll without that sugar in there, so you can't reduce it, I'm afraid. What you can, look for our recipes that just by nature are designed to use less sugar and you'll find you'll get a better result. And along those lines, Cherry asked, well, is there a savory Swiss roll? I don't have a recipe for one, but I would say you could, um, you would treat it almost like a souffle baked in a pan. So you'd have that softness of the eggs. And I would say cheese would be an essential ingredient to get that set volume and flexibility. So He's given me something to think about, Cherry. Hmm. Okay, so in this time, a minute of chatting, see how it's lightened in color and it looks creamy, but we're not looking for anything. I'm not gonna tell you, well, whip until it has a ribbon or anything like that. It's just nicely combined. I'm just gonna set my whisk aside. Now it's time to add the cocoa powder. This recipe doesn't call for flour, and it's really the eggs and the sugar and this little bit of cocoa powder. That's it. But that creates a sponge cake that's flexible. Now, you'll notice in the recipe, I call for Dutch processed co cocoa powder. Half a cup or the same as 60 grams by weight. So I'm going to move you over, Michael, to my little cocoa powder vignette here. So I want to talk about cocoa powder because this is a question I get asked all the time. Why Dutch processed cocoa powder and what is the difference? So these are the three major types of cocoa powder available. This is regular cocoa powder and you can see it's lighter in color. The texture of all cocoa powders tends to be about the same. The difference is its makeup. So Dutch processed cocoa powder right here, you can see it has a more intense color to it. It actually has a milder taste but the key difference is that Dutch process is removing some of the acidity in regular cocoa powder. What this does is it intensifies the chocolate flavor. It makes it less acidic, so it actually tastes a little milder. It intensifies the color. And the reason we call for it in recipes is primarily for, in this case, color and flavor. But in recipes that call for baking soda or baking powder, then you, if it calls for Dutch process, you want that because it's factoring in the balance of acidity with leavening ingredients and how these ingredients react in the oven. So that's why it's called for. So in this case, if you don't have Dutch processed cocoa powder, you can use regular and it will not compromise the end result of the recipe. I just love the color and the flavor of the Dutch process here. Now over here is black cocoa powder. This is relatively new to the home bakers. Um, you can find it often in bulk stores or baking specialty stores or gourmet stores. It's not a grocery store item yet. Um, and it's a darker cocoa powder that you often see used in, there's a certain sandwich cookie with a cream filling. That's the cocoa powder that gets that black, black color. Now it makes things look really chocolatey, but, Beware, because the regular and Dutch processed cocoa powder have about a 20% fat content, where the black cocoa powder has a lower fat content. It can be as low as 12%. So that can actually change the texture of your cakes and your cookies, and you may find they're a little drier or a little more crumbly. So I prefer using the black cocoa powder when I'm making a pastry dough or a cookie dough of some variety. And I, I leave the regular cocoa powders um, to the cakes and, and such. 
So I wanted to have that cocoa conversation before we got going here, just so I don't start whipping my whites and then get sidetracked. So now I'm going to take my 60 grams or half a cup of cocoa and just sift that right in. You always have to sift your cocoa powder because see, you get those little lumps in there. And now I'm just going to carefully, this is why I picked a deep bowl for this recipe. Whisk this in just until it's smooth. And this is where it will look like kind of a regular non-sponge cake batter. There we go. Yeah, let's zoom in on this so you can see. So this is why we sift. There are no lumps at this point. And so now, before I get into the whites, I'm really stretching out this sponge cake process. That way, if you are baking along, you can take your time and get these uh, steps done as we chat. I'm just gonna make some space here and get my whites ready to whip. But before I start, let's talk about the pan. When you're making a Swiss roll or jelly roll, you need a baking tray with a lip on it. And it would will be called a jelly roll or Swiss roll pan. Now, typically, a Swiss roll pan is smaller than a conventional baking tray. And here it is. So by inches, this is 10 by 15. And the reason it recipes are designed for this size is because it makes an, a proportionate sized dessert. So I build my sponge cake to fit in this pan so that it's ultimately about a centimeter and a half, but then you get nice eight nice portions out of this size pan once the cake is rolled up. Now you may be see, saying to yourself, and then I had, I had Chua, forgive me if I haven't pronounced your name correctly, Erica was asking, and I had multiple requests um, through social media asking, well, I don't have a 10 by 15 pan. Do I have to go out and buy another pan? You don't. And we're going to walk through this. So you can make this recipe using, most people do have a nine by 13. Uh, this is a standard size pan. Uh, even though it has higher sides, you can still make this recipe. And this is a standard a uh, half sheet pan, so it is 11 by 17 inches. This is all in inches. And you can easily convert to centimeters. And just for the sake of the math, we're gonna walk through this. So you have two ways to treat the recipe. You can make the recipe as I'm presenting it to you here. And if you're using a nine by 13 pan, hold back about 20% of the batter because you don't wanna put all the batter in, it'll be too thick and you'll have trouble rolling it and you won't get quite the size. If you've got an 11 by 17 pan, well then you can make the full recipe, but then create a little barrier with tin foil to frame out the 10 by 15. Because it's a light sponge cake batter, it won't push away from the foil or change your shape too much. Um, so that way you can keep the recipe the same. Now option two is if you have either of these pans, you can calculate the percentage, which brings up a good question. It was Erica, no, Cherry was asking about ratios and thinking in ratios. If you want to actually change the measurements of this recipe, so you're not wasting ingredients and you know that you have the exact amount, you certainly can. You have to make this recipe by weights in order to calculate the, uh, uh, the correct conversion. And so here we go. The other day it was the Pearson Square we were talking about. Now this is simpler math. We're just talking about calculating area. So in a nutshell, we've got my 10 by 15 pan here, and I've drawn in the smaller nine by 13, the larger 11 by uh, 17. So what you need to do is calculate the area of the space you're filling so that you come down with the right equation. So to calculate, the recipe is based on 10 by 15, which equals 150 square inches. You do the same calculation, your length and width of the smaller pan comes out to a smaller number. Your base number is always the base recipe. So in 150 square inches in this case, you do the division. So we find out that you need 78% of the volume of this recipe to fill a nine by 13 pan. So you reduce every weight 
by 20 to 22 percent. I round into 20 because that small amount won't make a huge difference in this recipe. And then in the case of going bigger to get the same volume set, you'll end up with a bigger cake, but you need to do the same math. The 150 stays at the bottom and you know you need to increase your recipe by 1.25. Um, so you can do the calculations by each weight of each ingredient. And then you're probably wondering, well, now how do I figure out a, a fraction of an egg? Because that is a kind of a kooky, uh, you might end up needing a third of an egg or half of an egg. How do you measure half of an egg? Well, an, a large egg weighs 60 grams. So regardless of what size egg you have, you can calculate that for this recipe. So you would need 360 grams uh, of egg for this recipe to make it. Um, if you find out you need a fraction of an egg, you simply take that one egg. Um, well, you would have to, in this case, separate it out. Know that a white is 30 grams and a yolk is 30 grams. So you separate that egg and then weigh out that difference to get the appropriate fraction. Okay, so if you're baking along, I'm sure you've caught up right now, and now your head's spinning with some math you didn't know I was going to throw at you. I've added a pinch of salt to my six egg whites. Now I'm going to whip them on high speed, and I'm not adding sugar. All the sugar has been added into the base recipe here. I want to whip to a medium peak, and when you're whipping whites without sugar, that whip to soft, medium, stiff peak happens very quickly. So we'll just stay with this here, whip it up. Hopefully with these in my ears, you can hear me okay, because I don't have a mic leaning over the mixer, but I won't say anything critical while we're whipping these whites. Egg whites whipped without sugar look very different than egg whites whipped with sugar. When you add sugar, the sugar dissolves in, and you know what liquid sugar looks like. It's glossy and shiny. These egg whites don't look glossy and shiny. So don't be put off or surprised when you see that here. Oh, everyone can hear me fine. Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> and don't worry, I, I am, while I took some questions in advance, I will take some questions throughout once I get a chance and I'm not so focused on properly whipping my egg whites. This is not a time to go check your social media when you're whipping egg whites. But a great little tip, um, picking this up in a baker's kitchen. Uh, one of the best bits of advice when I was an apprentice um, was to be a good baker. When you've got lots on the go, you should always have something in your mixer, on the table, and in the oven. So you're using your space and your tools appropriately. So sometimes I would have to whip egg whites or cream but I was juggling checking the oven or chilling cakes or going to get apples to peel, what, what have you. If you can whip egg whites, you can also whip cream on a lower speed. You're not compromising the volume you get, you're just buying yourself more time. So if you do have to run to the sink or run out or attend to someone homeschooling right now, because a lot of people are dealing with that, you can do that, you just lower the speed. You can stop and start egg whites at any point when you're whipping them and come back to them. As they sit, they will collapse, but you can re-whip them to uh, the point you need them. Let's take a peek at what we have here. So if we can zoom in, Michael. Oh, this is great. This is a medium peak. So a soft peak, that's a perfect example. Can you see that? And yeah. in the... Yeah, as I pull the mixer out, or let's, it's harder to do with whites without sugar. See how the peak has a little bend to it, has a hint, woo, <laughs> going for a ride. <laughs> um, has a little curl to it. A stiff peak stands upright, woo, and a soft peak has a full curl. When you have egg whites with sugar added, you're going to get a more defined distinction between a soft peak, a medium peak, and a firm peak. Um, without the sugar added, as here, these are just with whites, you can see they're a bit frothier looking just by nature. You can actually see the distinct bubbles within that. That's because there is no sugar. When you add the sugar, it, it tightens and makes the air bubbles smaller, and that makes a meringue more stable. So a French meringue, where you add 200 grams of sugar to four egg whites, 
makes a really tight meringue that's thick and glossy and has very, very fine, small bubbles. This is a bit lighter and it's in intended to be. So now I'm just gonna move this out of the way. Now I have more space to work. And now you know why I don't sing when I cook. I can make, the girl can make cakes, she cannot sing. I'm just gonna loosen this up because in my chatting time, it's tightened up a bit. Now I'll add a third of the whites. And I'm going to use my whisk to pull the whites through this batter base because the whisk is, that was our tight, oh, that base is tight, there we go, just from sitting. Um, it pulls the whites through the base batter without breaking them down too much. And don't be frightened. This is a do not panic moment because you're gonna see those whites deflate and this base is going to soften and liquefy a little bit. That is planned for, that is factored into the recipe that this just happens. Now what is key here is to not fold the whites in fully because we have the second opportunity when I add the remaining whites. So you don't have to keep folding and folding. If you see streaks or marks, as you can see here, they're not perfectly combined. That's okay because folding these in provides that opportunity. Okay, and now the second fold I find is easier to do using a spatula and you pull around and under and lift gently. So you will find, yes, it will be pourable by the time you finish. And I find it's better to work faster and a little more vigorously because once you are starting to work those whites in, time is your enemy. So if you go faster, 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 you're gonna get it in, blended in better and keep the structure of the egg whites. But the egg whites, the whipped egg whites have whipping memory. They're gonna remember they were stretched out to full volume. So even though this batter will deflate a little bit, those egg whites already have that bit of air. And when they hit the heat of the oven, the air within each bubble will expand, pushing that cake upwards. So that's how eggs work as a leavener in a cake recipe. So you can see I'm, be I'm being pretty aggressive with my cake batter here, but it's got a nice volume to it. And when you pull from the bottom, you shouldn't see a streak of darker batter. Then you know you've got it fully incorporated. So I can switch out here. Just gonna give myself a little tidy up. I do not like a messy kitchen. That little spot of batter would drive me nuts. There we go, clean as we go. So here is the 10 by 15 pan. Now you know the calculations to do, figure if you have otherwise. I've lined the bottom with parchment. I have not greased the sides. It's okay that this cake sticks to the sides. It'll hold its shape and its volume. And in goes that batter. Your oven should be preheated to 350. go and you can really see how fluid it is and I'm just going to use an offset spatula and coax it gently now this is where I'm not pressing firmly at all coaxing it into the corners and this is really why I love this particular Swiss roll recipe I find some Swiss or jelly roll batters can be a little um, thicker and it's the flour is absorbing the moisture and you really have to spread it carefully so that it's level and you can't see it now, but if you were to bake it and then if you didn't level it, it would have lumps to it. But I find because this is slightly fluid, it spreads well, it bakes up wonderfully level and it makes it easy to roll. So I'm gonna pop this in the oven. And I know some of you asked last time, I totally forgot to pull that cake out of the oven. As soon as we cut camera, I realized, oh my gosh, the cake, and I got it. And I did post the pictures of the real cake. So at least you know I, that was the real cake uh, in the oven. But we will have time. Oh yeah, we'll have time. I need to set the timer. 
I'm going to set it for 20 minutes at a 350 still oven. If you have a convection oven that you need to adapt, that should be set to 325. That equivalent in metric is 160. Now, part of the challenge that you can have when it comes to a traditional jelly roll or Swiss roll is you need to shape it into that roll shape while it's still warm. And you're thinking, okay, so how are we going to manage that here on this episode of OEM 101? I do have a cake that I baked just an hour ago and I've let it cool completely. That is the double bonus of this recipe is that you actually want to roll your jelly roll after it's cooled and you don't have to do that pre-shaping. It's flexible. Now, it's something you are going to witness, and I think this is very important for you to see. When I pull that cake out of the oven, you're going to see it doesn't look like this. It's going to be poofy and light, and it's going to start collapsing in front of your eyes. And another, do not panic. Just remind yourself, okay, and it said do not panic. It will collapse a little bit and sink. So it's going to hold around the edges, but it will sink. But you can see how beautifully level it is. It's nice and soft. Um, I'll show you how to check the doneness, but this is the cake we're going to work uh, with now, having cooled for an hour. So the option in the recipe link that I did provide to you, I created a Black Forest version with a chocolate cream filling and a cooked cherry element, topping it with whipped cream. And I love that combination of chocolate, cream, and cherries. But I don't know how you are with ingredients, but I did not have access to cherries this time of year. But what I do have are raspberries. So instead of using a cooked cherry filling, I'm just going to tumble a layer of fresh raspberries over my chocolate cream. You could certainly use a, a jam layer, and I'll tell you at what point to add that as well. But I do have um, the chocolate cream elements ready. Mm. Oh, in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> okay so this doesn't look like much but it is basically a version of ganache and it's you could call it a cheater chocolate mousse but uh, a chocolate ganache is typically equal parts whipping cream and chocolate melted together. And then it's used to make truffles, fillings, the base for a mousse, any number of things. This ratio, I have one cup or 250 ml of um, whipping cream that I heated and I poured over two ounces. So just 60 grams of chocolate. So it's really a lot lighter. And you can see it's, it's going to have almost like a milk chocolate creamy taste to it. I whisked it together. And then you wanna chill this completely. And you just whip it like whipped cream and you've got an easy cheater chocolate mousse or you need to dollop a nice chocolate cream on top of a dessert you've made. If you've made something like a bread pudding, these days we're all making sourdough and if you have extra bread kicking around, you can do more than make croutons and toast with it. Um, you can make a lovely bread pudding or a French toast and then adding this chocolate cream is amazing. So this I'm going to whip by hand. You could use electric beaters, but look at that. So the recipe is, if you find the original um, Swiss roll recipe, you will find this chocolate cream ratio, but I'll just recap it for you. One cup or 250 ml of whipping cream poured over two ounces, 60 grams of dark chocolate. And you need to use couverture, baking chocolate, not chocolate chips that you put in chocolate chip cookies. Those are designed to hold their shape. Couverture chocolate is typically chopped and it's meant for baking. It comes in squares sometimes, depends how you buy it. If you're getting serious about your baking, you will find, um, you can buy what are called uh, tallets and they look like chocolate chips, but are flatter and it just saves you chopping, but they, it is couverture or baking chocolate. So I'm getting my exercise here and I might as well take a minute to answer some questions. While I switch, I'm just gonna use my mat so my bowl doesn't slide around. I'm gonna switch hands. A little tip, if you are whisking anything by hand, don't whisk with your wrist. 
this is the weakest part of your arm. And you're going to find if you whisk, you get tired. You want to whisk with your upper arm. The mo motion or movement comes from the elbow, and then you won't get that wrist fatigue. And you can whisk back and forth, back and forth. And it's up to you how whatever's comfortable to hold the whisk. But this is stirring where this is whisking. I mean, we're just coaxing some volume in there. So let's see if I can whisk and read at the same time. And I'll take a question from someone. Uh, Bonnie's asking, baking chocolate. What's the chocolate percentage? Bonnie, are you going to get a taste of this cake? Bonnie's my neighbor. Um, that's a great question. And for this recipe, I call for dark chocolates. And depending what country you live in, sometimes you refer to the chocolates differently. In the world of dark chocolate, you have semi-sweet and bittersweet. And in terms of percentage, a semi-sweet is more in the 51 to 58% category. That means it's milder, it's a little sweeter. For family-friendly desserts, I find that's a better option. Um, bittersweet chocolate is upwards of 65 to 70%. It's stronger, it earns its name, it's more intense, and it's good when you really want that chocolate intensity. So for this particular recipe, anything semi-sweet to bittersweet. So 51 to 70% will cover you just fine. You don't need to add any sugar to this at all. You can see it's, it almost looks like a milkshake at this point. Oh, what if you put that in an ice cream maker? Ideas. Are you zooming in, Michael? Can you see? Okay, I'll wait. I'll wait because it's. There we go. I'll take another question while I'm just finishing. Oh, okay. Uh, Saggy, if I have mispronounced your name, please forgive me, but you asked this question earlier and it was good, so I'm glad you've rewritten it. Um, I have a Swiss roll recipe where I melt the sugar and add it to the eggs while whipping it. What's the difference with the recipe? Now that too, the goal is to create flexibility um, by melting the sugar. Liquid. Are we good? Oh, <laughs> my mom just called. Hi, mom. <laughs> hopefully she's watching while she's trying to call me. Can people see me? I Hopefully we, we got two people. We got two people. Yay. Welcome back. <laughs> okay. Everybody, you found me. Oh, welcome back. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. That's the first time. And uh, it, it was a puzzle for everyone. You didn't miss anything, believe me. I didn't do anything while you were gone. I'll just give a recap on what I've been up to. So the Swiss roll um, is in the oven, almost done baking. I've got my cooled one here. Before the screen went black, I was whipping my chocolate cream. So that was the 250 ml of whipping cream with 60 grams of chocolate melted together, then chilled, and I just whipped it using a whisk. So that becomes the filling. I also have my whipped cream uh, for the top of the Swiss roll because I wanted to give this that black forest element. So this is one and a quarter cups, so 310 ml of whipping cream, a tablespoon plus a teaspoon of skim milk powder, stabilizes the whipped cream, and just two tablespoons of sugar. That's it, plain and simple. So is TJ saying I should start um, assembling now? Is this a good time? I am, I am going to check on the cake in the oven. So this is a marvelous comparison because this is the cake that's cooled this is the cake that's come out of the oven. And you can tell when a sponge cake is done just by pressing it. If you press it at the edge, that gives you an indication of what it should feel like when it's done, because the outside is always cooked before the center. You press in the center, and then from there, when you can see, you can see I'm not leaving a fingerprint, you know, oh my gosh, it smells amazing. Um, you know that it's fully cooked. Using a tester for a sponge cake does not yield the appropriate um, result. It may come clean, but it could be a false read. But as I'm even talking about this, you can probably see how it's 
sinking a little bit. This is factored into the recipe. It will collapse a bit as it cools. So I'm gonna put this back here. Now I will admit now that we went black, I, I thank you for coming back to stay for the, the best part, the assembly of the Swiss roll, but I have lost my feed to your question. So Michael, if there are questions you see pop up that I should answer, you just throw them um, my way because I think everyone can hear you and then I can hear you and we can handle these questions. Does that make sense? I did appreciate getting everyone's questions. So I do have some that you left um, beforehand. So I will come back to those two, but I wanna get assembling this cake. So you got to see the baked one. It, uh, it smells nice and chocolatey in here. A half a cup or 60 grams of cocoa powder is a fair bit of cocoa powder for a recipe. Um, so you will definitely smell it. Now, first thing I need to do is to loosen my cake from the pan. So I'm gonna run my palette knife around the inside edge of the pan. Like that. Now remember the parchment paper is underneath and see that flexibility? This cake is fully cooled. Where a normal sponge cake made with flour sets as it cools and it will crack if you let it cool too much. This, because it's gluten-free, um, we just have the cocoa and the whipped eggs keeps its flexibility. So it comes right out of the pan, look at that. Now I'm just going to work right on my uh, counter here because it's a wood counter. A cutting board is a good idea to work on. Uh, bakers like to work on wood surfaces because it holds an even temperature and it builds up a natural um, resistance that you, if you're rolling dough, things have a tendency not to stick. Um, if you have a kitchen counter that's granite but smooth and flat, that will work just fine too. Just make sure no knives on, on your counter. I don't worry about so much with wood because I can sand it out. Now, the thing I need to do, if I were to flip this over onto the wood surface, it could potentially stick. It's a nice dry surface to the top of the cake, but as insurance, I give it a dusting with icing sugar. And that way, when I flip it over, it won't stick. And now I peel away the parchment carefully. I like to reuse my parchment paper when I can. This is definitely a time when I can't. And now you can trim this if you wish, but I find with this recipe, you don't get dry edges to this uh, Swiss roll cake. So I don't bother wasting any cake at all. I hope everyone has found me back again. And if you're new to this, I am making a chocolate Swiss roll that is gluten-free doubling up on the chocolate with this chocolate cream. I'm going to add fresh raspberries to it and top this with whipped cream. So a nice spread, and I'm gonna leave a little space at the bottom of my Swiss roll that becomes the bottom of the cake itself once rolled. So it doesn't look like, it's not a, remember this is not a mousse. And if you were doing a different filling, you don't have to do this chocolate cream filling. You could use just jam. You could use a cream cheese frosting or any other whipped, even just simply whipped cream. But you want a nice, generally a thin layer because if it's too full, you're just not going to get a clean slice and you won't get the full spiral effect because there'll be too much filling in there. So now that I've spread that nice and level, I'm going to sprinkle some fresh raspberries. So if you were doing the cooked cherry filling, this is the time to just sort of spoon it over top. Little of the juices too. I don't recommend fresh fruit here, simply because you'll, you'll find the fresh fruit as it thaws just leaves little watery pockets and it just won't be as appealing. I'm gonna save a couple of berries for on top, but really it's about a cup, 250 ml, that would be, in weight, about 160 grams. And then when you roll the cake, you lift up and over, up and over, up and over, up and over. And there we go. So as you're folding it, don't try and, it's not like a cinnamon roll where you wanna get it as tight as possible. You actually have to, because it's a spongy cake, lift up as 
as you saw that I was doing there. Now I'm just going to clear off my icing sugar and bring my platter. And you can probably tell the way I'm handling this cake, it's not overly fragile. This is not too delicate. So if you wanted to, you could just stop right here and call it a day and, and put this in the fridge like this, maybe a fresh dusting of icing sugar on top. I'm gonna get a new spatula and I'm going to fully cover the Swiss roll with whipped cream. So I'll put quite a bit on top. So this is whipped cream that's been just lightly sweetened with that skim milk powder to give it stability. And I find when it comes to this look, fancy piping, just, you don't need it. You wanna keep it simple. If you were doing this at holiday time, this would make a fabulous Bouche Noel or um, Yule Log. Rotate around. So I put the whipped cream on top and then I work it towards the bottom. That way it's, you get a cleaner edge at the bottom. Like so, and then I saved a bit of cream for the front and the back. So it's a nice layer of cream, but not excessive. Okay, so there we go. And you can just use your palette knife to create a pattern if it swirls or swishes. I guess I'm going more for the Yule log effect here. And then the finishing touch really is up to you. You could do a dusting of cocoa powder if you wanted to. I'm going to take some block chocolate and a vegetable grater and just make some chocolate shavings. A vegetable peeler, I should say. You get, with dark chocolate, you get some nice little curls without doing anything fancy whatsoever. If there are kids in the house, well, you know what? Anything that's cake-like deserves sprinkles, doesn't it? Do we have any questions coming in, Michael? Can you put the chambord into the whipped cream? Oh, yes, please. You can put chambord into the whipped cream. Really highlight that raspberry flavor. Um, generally, I bake without spirits uh, just to make these appealing to everyone. But, of course, if you are adding uh, orange liqueur, or any other flavors, it's up to you. And you would add that, you could add it to the chocolate cream filling. You could also add it to the whipped cream to really enhance that flavor. Just a nice little sprinkling of these shavings on top. Hints at the chocolate that's inside. There we go. How about a little raspberry here and there? And there we go, chocolate Swiss roll. Now, I have to cut into it, don't I, right? Yeah, does everyone agree I should cut into it? I, normally, I would let it set completely because the cream is soft in the center. So I hope you bear with me because this may look a little bit sloppy, but I want you to see just that uh, profile contrast between the chocolate cream, the berries, and that beautiful chocolate Swiss swirl on the inside. So, a serrated knife is best for this job. Oh, that first slice is so hard. Every time you see me slice a cake on, uh, oh yeah, I'm, I'm nervous. <laughs> Cause that first slice is the hardest. So you can see the raspberries in there. We've got this lovely moist. The Swiss roll itself, because there is no flour and because of its, the nature of its flexibility, 
It stays moist and fresh for days. You have a lovely matching of cake consistency with the fluffy filling, the whipped cream on top. This Swiss roll recipe really does deliver and I hope you'll give it a try. It's a great opportunity to master a new skill. You can go back, we'll post this entire recipe, both parts, <laughs> so that you can go back, especially when it comes to those pan adjustments, if you need to adjust the recipe or adjust the pan to suit what you have in your kitchen, whatever it takes, I would love for you to make this recipe because baking is about sharing. And here on Oh Yum, that is what we're about, baking to share, sharing the knowledge, to make you a better and happier baker. So it's time for me to have a piece of cake. And a last little tidbit of information. So we're gonna put the boat out there again um, for next week's Oh Yum 101. And a couple of things. Remember, if you make the Swiss roll, hashtag Oh Yum 101 when you post it, because I am following that and I will see it and I go in and I, I, I've i seen the croissants you've been making and the sponge cakes you've been making. So this is next on your list. But for the next vote, I want you to keep in mind that my birthday is coming up. And here in North America, it's Mother's Day weekend. So whether you're baking a birthday cake or a Mother's Day treat, there's going to be a theme to next week's vote. So see you then. Enjoy. I love that there are no crumbs. Mm. Bye, everybody.